Hey guys, this is Brother Ray Jones with the First Church of God in Princeton, West Virginia. I want to welcome you to Midweek Bible Study. I want to thank you for tuning in and being a part of this lesson tonight. Uh, tonight's lesson is going to be the first of eight lessons from the Beatitudes that Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 5. In just a few moments, we're going to get into uh, the first of these. And uh, well, we want to take a moment just to uh, pray together this evening asking that the Lord will guide us and direct us and enlighten us as we learn and grow together in his word. So let's agree in prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be able to study your word tonight. Lord, we believe with all of our hearts that you've provided in your word everything that we need to know and to serve and to honor you. Uh, Lord, teach us tonight as we look into your word. Help us to grow by it and help us, Lord, to be more like you because we've studied together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray and say together, Amen and Amen. Thank you for agreeing in prayer. Um, in Matthew the fifth chapter, beginning at verse one, going through verse four, we read these words. And seeing the multitudes, he, speaking of Jesus, went up on the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And then he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Uh, these first four verses are somewhat of the introduction to a, a longer message that Jesus preached that is found in Matthew chapter five, chapters 5, 6, and 7. Now, we refer to this portion of Scripture as the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, I often refer to it as the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher who ever lived. It's in these particular chapters of the Bible that we record Jesus' teaching where he really made the Christian faith very, very plain. Now, in other portions of Scripture, Jesus summed up all of Christianity with these words. He said the whole long prophets are summed up with Love God first with everything you've got, and then love your neighbor as yourself. That is uh, the great commandment. And quite honestly, if we simply live that out, if we abide by that, everything else will fall into place. Well, what it actually looks like to love God first with everything you've got, and then love your neighbor as yourself, gets explained in more detail in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, matter of fact, I would encourage you to read the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. Read that once a month and you will get very enlightened and you will grow in your Christian faith. But tonight we're going to see as we begin looking in the uh, first several verses of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus teaches about these things called the uh, the Beatitudes or the beautiful attitudes that we're to have. Now, as Jesus gets into these verses or into this message, he says in verse 3, uh, or he uses throughout these several, these several verses the word blessed. Uh, he starts off with blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, this term blessed in the Greek is markarios, and what it actually means is happy or to be envied is um, are the poor. Uh, you could interchange those words there where Jesus is saying blessed. You could say happy are or to be envied are. So as Jesus gets into this, the first one that he mentions is this. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I don't know about you, but I have never, ever in my life thought of poor as being an enviable or a happy place to be. Uh, to define poor, we could do so with these words. It is lacking sufficient money to live at a standard considered comfortable or normal in a society. Uh, most of us are familiar with poverty. Some of us may have experienced it or are experiencing it now. 
but it's not something that is desirable when it comes to a financial situation. Uh, in our nation, in the United States of America, to define poor, they do so by the federal uh, poverty level. Uh, this, there's an amount of money that the government has established that is the set a minimum amount of gross income that a family needs for food, clothing, transportation, shelter, and other necessities. And just so you can kind of have an idea of in dollar figures where that stands in 2020, if you are one person living in your household and you make $12,760 or more, you're not considered poor. The federal poverty level for one person in a household is $12,760 and below. For two people, it is $17,240. For three people, it is $21,720. And for a family of four, it is $26,200. In other words, if you fall below that level for those, um, that amount of money for those certain numbers in your household, you are considered poor by the United States government. And I will uh, we'll try to see to it that there's a link uh, in the comments where you can access that information if you want to look at that a little bit more. Now, again, none of us want to be in that financial situation. None of us want to be one person in a household trying to survive on a little more than $1,000 a month. And yet there are a lot of people who find themselves in that situation. Some people find themselves in poverty due to circumstances beyond their control. Um, maybe they're involved in an accident and they're not able to work any longer. Maybe uh, an illness came their way that they didn't ask for and it's left them in a situation where they're at the poverty level. Others had some maybe un avoidable misfortune that came their way. It's not their fault. It is just one of those things where life happened and now they have found themselves in poverty. Others enter into poverty and choose to stay there somewhat, at least in part, if not in whole, because of their own decisions. And in some cases, it can be a learned behavior that may even get passed down from gener one generation to another. Uh, however someone may end up at the poverty level or in a financially poor state, none of us really would want to be there. At least I'd hope we wouldn't want to be there. I had a, a good friend of mine in Louisiana by the name of Ed Fleming, and uh, he used to say that growing up he was so poor that they had to eat dry beans for breakfast, drink water for lunch, and swell up for supper. Now maybe you can identify with that, and maybe you felt that way at some point in your life. I hope that's not your reality financially, but when it comes to um, spiritual things, I, I hope you can begin to understand tonight being poor in spirit, according to Jesus, is something that is enviable or something we're to be happy about. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, the answer to that is this. We need to be fully aware of our spiritual bankruptcy. We need to be fully aware that in and of ourselves, as we stand before God, we have no claim in our own merit, in our own power, in our own intelligence, in our own goodness, in any way, shape, or form. When we stand before God, apart from coming to Him through Jesus Christ, we are utterly desolate. We are spiritually bankrupt. And here's how we know this. From a biblical standpoint, uh, it is very clear in the scripture. Romans 3.23 says this, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every one of us, uh, from the youngest to the oldest, uh, from the most financially well-off to the, those of us who uh, 
are on the other end of that spectrum and even in poverty, um, whatever race, whatever color, um, whatever life experience, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Isaiah 53, 6 underscores this even further. Isaiah 53, 6 says these words, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him, speaking of Jesus, the iniquity of us all. In and of ourselves, we are morally and spiritually bankrupt, my friends. And when we become aware of that, we can do something about it. But if we're not aware of it, we, we never take the action needed to make things any different. The biggest obstacle to realizing our own spiritual poverty is pride. Pride very easily steps in the way and gets us thinking, well, why do, what do you mean I'm poor in spirit? I'm okay. I'm not that bad of a person. I, I haven't done this, that, or the other. You know, I, I'm pretty good to people, and I pay my taxes, and, you know, I treat people reasonably well, at least as long as they're treating me well, right? Well, let me tell you. If we try to think in our own merits that we're okay, and if we just try to rest in that idea that because we haven't done anything too bad, then we're not spiritually bankrupt, well, that's not going to cut it with God. Our pride is getting in the way there. And pride will keep us from acknowledging our spiritual poverty. James 4, 6 says these words, But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. My friends, we will never experience the grace of God if we're walking in pride and arrogance. No one gets to the point of receiving God's grace until they humble themselves to do so. Proverbs 18 12 says these words before destruction the heart of man is haughty and before honor is humility if you are walking in pride and arrogance you will not acknowledge your spiritual desolation or your spiritual poverty your spiritual bankruptcy pride keeps us from doing that and pride and haughtiness always leads us to destruction but the writer of Proverbs, again, says in the latter part of 1812, before honor is humility. Now, I want you to understand tonight, when it comes to pride, there are different kinds of it. And the very worst kind of pride that someone can have is what I call spiritual pride. It's where we who are somewhat religious, we who maybe have even been around the church quite a bit in our lives we can be lulled into this false sense of security that uh, we're, we're pretty good people because we we hang around pretty good people or we were raised in a congregation all of our lives and uh, while there's some merit to hanging around with good people and attending church throughout your life please hear me clearly those things in and of, them, of themselves do not make us right in God's eyes in Isaiah, the 64th chapter, the 6th verse, the Bible underscores this. We are all like an unclean thing, and all of our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. If we think that we are something in and of ourselves... And we think and, and it can even come up with a lot of things that compared to other people, we've done well and we've done right and we're not that bad of people. Uh, we'll never get to the point where we acknowledge our full need of Jesus Christ and our, our utter spiritual bankruptcy that will lead us to that point. Uh, the Apostle Paul had to come to terms with this. 
In Philippians chapter 3, the first 11 verses, we read his account of this. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of the evil workers, and beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I am more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I've counted for loss for Christ. Yes, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now note carefully what Paul is saying here. Again, these verses are found in Philippians 3, beginning at verse 1 and going through verse 11. Paul is declaring here in these verses that, hey, if anybody has anything in this world in a religious sense to brag about, I do. And then he goes on to enumerate uh, his pedigree, if you will. He was an Israelite. He, he was born of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as he describes it. Um, con, he, concerning the law, he was a Pharisee, and he was the top of his class in studying the religious law and was an expert in making sure that that law was kept, at least as much as is humanly possible. Paul was so religious and zealous as a Pharisee that at one time in his, in his life, while he was Saul uh, of Tarsus, or known as Saul of Tarsus, he believed that, the Christ, that Jesus was a heretic and those who um, followed Jesus were, were, had been misled. And they were heretics as well. And he persecuted them. He, he sought them out. He murdered them. He tortured Christians. And then at one point, Jesus met Saul of Tarsus while traveling on the Damascus Road. And Jesus himself revealed himself to Paul and explained to him in no uncertain terms, Paul or Saul, you are wrong. I am the Jesus and you are persecuting me by persecuting my children. That day, Saul of Tarsus became a believer. And later on, we, became, we uh, began to identify him as Paul the Apostle. And all of that religious activity that Paul could have bragged about, he said, look, none of that matters. Uh, that whole time when he thought he was spiritually rich, he was actually spiritually poor. And he had to come to that point of realizing and acknowledging his moral bankruptcy and his spiritual poverty before he could find the true riches that Christ wanted to give him. And those true riches are in knowing him. Paul uh, declared that as saying in the, with these words, all of that that was gained for me was lost for, for Christ. It was rubbish. Now... Here's what is really important and here's what is true riches and here is what really counts. That I know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. That one day I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. My friends, listen to me. Until we reach that point in life where we genuinely realize that we are poor in spirit, we are spiritually bankrupt, we have nothing in and of ourselves to bring as any claim before God. Without him, 
we are helpless and hopeless until we reach that point we will not invite him into our lives and receive the true riches that only he can give well how do we get to that point the best way to see our spiritual poverty is to come into God's presence in Isaiah chapter 6 the prophet Isaiah had an experience with God and he recounts that in the first five verses of Isaiah chapter 6 let me read that for us in the year that King Uzziah died I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple and above it stood seraphim each one had six wings with two he covered his face with two he covered his feet and with two he flew and one cried to the other saying holy 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 is the Lord God of hosts the whole earth is filled with his glory and the post of the door was shaken by the voice of him who cried out and the house was filled with smoke so I said to me woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts Isaiah had this experience where he genuinely came into the presence of God and when God's glory filled the room that he was in and, and remember that Isaiah was at a time of loss and mourning uh, the king had died and there was turmoil all around and Isaiah had enough about him to go to the, the house of God to seek the face of God and God showed up there and met him there and when he came into the presence of God he suddenly became keenly aware of how much he lacked in and of himself. My friends, hear me tonight. When we come into the presence of God, we see his glory, we see his majesty, and standing before him, compared to him, our spiritual bankruptcy has to show itself. It's kind of like being in a room that hadn't been painted for a while. You get used to the color that's on the wall. But then all of a sudden, let's say it's in a white room, like behind me you can see some, some very nice walls that have been painted white. But I promise you, if a fresh coat, a brand new coat of white paint started being applied on one of these walls, we would begin to see how off-white, if you will, these walls really are. I'm not trying to take away from these walls. Don't get me wrong. I'm just trying to simply make this point. When something pure is presented, any impurity anywhere else begins to show itself. And while we may make the argument that, well, compared to so-and-so, I'm okay, and I'm doing better than uh, brother or sister so-and-so over that way, well, that, that's not a healthy way to be, for one thing. And maybe we ain't doing as good as we thought compared to them. That could be, that was definitely some arrogance that can come up in there. But here's the bottom line. When we compare ourselves to God, all of us come up lacking. And when we come into the presence of God, God will reveal to us just how spiritually poor we are. And when we realize our spiritual poverty, we can then cry out to him and receive his riches. Listen to what Isaiah did in the next verses. In Isaiah 6, verses 6 and 7. After coming into the presence of God and realizing that he was a man of unclean lips dwelling with people of unclean lips, he says these words. One of the seraphim came, flew to me and having in his hand a live coal which was taken from the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is purged. My friends, if you will, in this vision that Isaiah had, this was a, a supernatural vision of uh, that angel doing uh, for Isaiah what Christ wants to do for us. Now, I'm not saying that there's got to be a literal angel taking a literal coal from a literal altar touching it to our literal lips. That was symbolic, if you will, of the spiritual cleansing that Isaiah needed. And the cleansing that you and I need today 
is by putting our faith in Christ. When we realize our spiritual poverty, as we stand before God and in his presence, we have nothing to bring except ourselves. And as we bring ourselves to him and receive the riches that only he can offer, then the kingdom of heaven is ours. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Because when we realize our utter desolation and spiritual bankruptcy before our God, we can then position ourselves to humbly receive the riches of salvation that only comes through him. My friend, I pray that you have realized your spiritual bankruptcy. If you've yet to do so, my prayer for you is that you do so very, very soon. And when you realize it, will you call upon him? Will you receive the riches of his salvation? Will you allow him to come in to your heart, to change your life, to cleanse you from your sin? Those who are poor in spirit are blessed because then when we come to him, ours is the kingdom of heaven. I hope you've received a blessing from this tonight. I hope um, that you will take this in and apply it and that it will help you be more the person that God wants you to be. And if this has blessed you, please feel free to pass it on to others. I appreciate your time this evening. Thank you and may God bless you.